Hello, everyone. Good morning. Man, 1,700 people. <laughs> Have I seen this many people before in one room? Well, maybe, but never at KotlinConf. Thank you all for coming. It's very exciting to be here. Today, we'll talk about Kotlin, and I hope it will be an inspiring opening for the next few days. So, what should we start with? Numbers. I've been showing the usage numbers uh, in every keynote because this is something that helps me get the feeling of who we are and how we're doing. So if we go back a few years, we released 1.0 uh, back in 2016, and uh, that release was used by about 200,000 people, which is an amazing number. It's like much more than in this room, right? So it's a lot of people. And uh, this, this was only a start. So by, by the way, when I say it's been used by this many people, it means people who actually opened a file in an editor and changed something. So maybe they haven't put it in production, but they did something with Colin Code. Then 1.1 got half a million users, and 1.2 over 2 million, and 1.3, which is the current version, uh, is over 4 million now, which is a pretty impressive number. But what is possibly a little more impressive to me that it's only been almost four years. 2016, February, we released 1.0. Today, it's over 4 million users in the last year. I'm really impressed, and this is something that inspires me a lot. But why should we care about usage numbers at all? Right, so th this is kind of a metric, which is just you know, a dull number. What I care about is making Kotlin a great product, making it a tool that everybody loves, that helps people, so on and so forth. So why should I care about the number? Well, actually, it's just some sort of validation for me. I believe that if people love the product, if they find language useful, if they want to solve their problems with it, then it's good. And this many people being interested in Colin means we're doing a good job. We, I mean all of us, everybody in the Colin community. So if we look back at our previous releases, we started well, relatively small, right? So we initially intended Colin as a new JVM language, as something that would, uh, was intended to modernize the JVM ecosystem. And 1.0 was JVM and Android plus a little bit experimental JavaScript. Then we stabilized the JavaScript and introduced experimental coroutines. Then we added multi-platform as an experimental feature as well. Then we stabilized coroutines and uh, Kotlin Native was already going and reached beta at uh, 1.3, and now we're looking at 1.4. So you can see the progression. We're widening the scope, we're covering more and more use cases, and this is basically what makes me feel that Kotlin has momentum in terms of scale, in terms of relevance, in terms of interest fr from the users. So Kotlin is becoming not a language, not a tool set, uh, not a word, it's an ecosystem, and we want it to, uh, to be an open ecosystem, meaning that it's welcoming to everybody, it is open to you, it is open to anyone who wants to uh, extend Kotlin, to wants, uh, who wants to build on top of Kotlin, and an ecosystem is more than just one thing, you know? Of course, it's, first of all, people. So Kotlin is not a piece of software, it's people. It's people united by ideas, by how we think, how we make code work, so on and so forth. And of course, on top of that, it is software. This is how I think about what Kotlin is. And the ecosystem is quite complex. Like here at the bottom of the slide, you can see a lot of boxes, and these are the Kotlin platform. This is what uh, we, the core team at JetBrains, are contributing to. Uh, we're making the compiler, the runtime, all the uh, code generators for different platforms, libraries, and uh, tools, IDE. Uh, we have 
our GitHub repo out, up, out there for everybody to contribute, so on and so forth. And this is kind of the basic level of it. But then everybody else is building on top of that. Right? So a lot of people make their own learning materials, uh, make plugins for the compiler and the tool chain, make their own libraries, uh, create pull requests on GitHub, uh, write us uh, bugs and feature requests, and everything goes to extend the platform, right? So here I want to uh, thank our contributors. Very many people are actually putting code into Kotlin through GitHub pull requests. And it's now not only the core team at JetBrains, but also a team at Google helping with the compiler. And thank you very much uh, for doing this for us. And also very many more people in the community doing the same thing. But this is only one type of contribution, right? Just code. And libraries are code, too, of course. But on top of that, there are many more things. Everybody who shares a case study on the internet, who asks questions, gives answers, shares news, comments on the social media, even uh, pushes the like button somewhere, everyone is bringing value to the community. And even if you don't have time to do that, you know, some of us are really busy doing their code, solving their business problems, even then, if you just report the usage stats, you can passively help the community. So I thank everyone who's helping us making, uh, making Kotlin better. Let's think for a second uh, about what we want Kotlin to become in the future. I think of it as a metaphor of a default language or a default tool. You know, it's something I'm reaching for uh, when I have a task to, to uh, complete, right? So, a default language is more than just something I know well. It's something I can use anywhere, something that will address any problem I have, and something that will scale uh, if the, the project takes off. Right? So to make Kotlin your default language, we need to make it work at any scale, on any platform, in any application area. And of course, we understand that we need to make it accessible, so it's relevant on any level of experience, because not everybody is already professional, right? So we want it to be default for all people. And the idea is, if I have something to work on, and I know Kotlin already, it will work for me. I can use it as my default tool. So how we do this? To accomplish this mission of being your default language, it's not an easy task. You need to be you know, quite good. And the way I think about making Kotlin this good is lowering barriers. So to be this kind of default language, we need to lower barriers between platforms so that you can transfer your knowledge from one platform to another. Lower barriers between people so that people can share their expertise and their code. And of course, ultimately, we want to sh uh, lower the barrier between human thought and working software so that if you have an idea, uh, there is a tool that is the medium for expressing the idea and not the obstacle in the way. This is how I think about it. And uh, of course, you noticed me talking a lot about platforms, right? We can, should work on any platform. We lower barriers between platforms. And this is one of the very important pieces of our strategy. So let's look at all those platforms Colin is working on now. And I'll open with server-side development. Again, uh, very long ago, uh, back in 2010, we, we, when we started Kotlin, we were thinking about the Java ecosystem, and Java is huge on, on the server. So it was one of the primary use cases we were thinking about back then. And now Kotlin is pretty strong on the server side. When you look through Kotlin job openings on the internet, there are really many server side jobs. So it's back end programming of all sorts and all kinds of businesses. And well, it makes sense, right? Uh, Kotlin is created for large-scale projects to make things robust, so on and so forth. And it's working there. There are very many interesting solutions for server-side programming in Kotlin. And uh, more and more are emerging. But I would like to highlight a few. You probably know that we've been friends with Spring for a long time. Uh, the Spring framework is one of the most popular web frameworks in the world. Uh, and it's dominating the Java world. And the official support for Kotlin was added to Spring back in 2017. 
And it's being expanded, so now it's not only Spring Boot, but also WebMVC, having even the docs uh, examples in Kotlin as well as Java. And there is WebFlux, which is great friends with core teams, um, making asynchronous requests just a breeze. So I think it's a very productive collaboration, and many, many people are using this. I'm really happy to see this. Now, our friends from Pivotal will give great talks uh, here at Colin Conf about Spring. So if you're interested in server-side development, make sure you go there. Also, we at JetBrains are making our own uh, connected applications framework called Kator, and it's used in our mission-critical software we develop at JetBrains. Actually, I think JetBrains was one of the big server-side users from the very beginning, because we started putting Kotlin code in production on the server before we released 1.0. And now Kator is pretty strong, and we make more products based on it. So Kotlin is really a strategic investment for JetBrains, and we're really committed to it. But it's not only us. Many more people are sharing their case studies, and here Colin Conf will uh, see talks about many interesting cases, and uh, our friends from Expedia and Intuit, and even the Norway tax office are using Kotlin on their servers. You know, this is uh, kind of an interesting transition. First, we're watching for early adopters, and like we're dog-footing Kotlin uh, at JetBrains. Then we saw startups and big companies and uh, finance firms start using it, and now it's governments. You know, I wonder who's next. Like, I don't know. We'll see next year. OK, so this is where we are on the server. And now, of course, there's many more platforms, and Android is very strong. So uh, Android has gone column first this year. And we can see that the ecosystem is really growing with the mobile development. So over 50% of professional developers working on and the Android platform are using Kotlin now. And 60% uh, of the top 1,000 apps in the Play Store, which means like a huge number of users, like millions and millions of users, if, I don't know, maybe billions, uh, these apps are using Kotlin. And the awesome team at Google is making great libraries uh, with Kotlin and is helping us improve the ecosystem. I thank my colleagues at Google again. It's been great working together. And to kind of reinforce this, his, uh, a number of applications that Google makes and puts out for everybody, I have a few of them in my pocket. So these are all using Kotlin. And I think it's pretty exciting to see how many interesting cases Kotlin is helping nowadays. But this story doesn't stop with Android. Because you know mobile is wider. There are two major platforms. And uh, in Kotlin, we're trying to make things work well for all platforms. And this is why we're investing in what we call mobile multi-platform, when you can share code between Android and iOS. And here's a list of apps. Many of them will have their case study talks here at Kotlin Conf. All these apps are using Kotlin multi-platform to share business logic between iOS and Android. And I'm kind of really thrilled by people having this running in production today. You know, It's pretty cool. And it's many people. You can see, and um, there are very well-known names and like entire solutions, like uh, the recent announcement by VMware. They're uh, doing their Workspace ONE solution, which is a number of applications for enterprise mobility. And they are using their business logic everywhere uh, on both iOS and Android. Or there is PlanGrade by Autodesk with a lot of construction projects involved. You can see the numbers are like millions and millions and millions in every app. So I would also like to highlight Quizlet here because they're going even further. They have two clients, iOS and Android, but they also have a web client where they also use Kotlin and share code. And this is uh, what we want Kotlin to become in the future, like the universal solution for every platform. So I think you'll enjoy all the talks about these uh, interesting use cases here. And I hope you'll uh, draw some interesting conclusions from these talks. So speaking of this universal picture of having Kotlin everywhere in every platform, this is what it might look like, right? So we're strong in the server, we're strong on mobile, uh, we're strong in the browser, 
You can make a desktop client as well. And of course, if you're JetBrains, you're doing IDs, and uh, you can make an ID plugin. So this is a full stack experience. You have one tool. You solve your problems on every platform with it. And this is exactly what we're doing at JetBrains. So you've probably heard that we're going to announce a new team product here at KotlinConf later today. And uh, I'm not telling you what it is. It's something for teams. That's it. But I'm going to tell you that this is how it works. And it runs Colin in every node. So it has Colin in the server, on iOS, on Android, on desktop, in, in the ID, and, and in the browser. It's all there. And uh, there will be, yeah, I'll show the docs a little later. Yeah, so this is what they share. Everything in this slide is shared. So it's a data model, it's validation procedures, RPC, even the view model. So you get like really close to the UI. It's a lot of shared stuff. And my colleagues will tell you more about it. Max uh, Shafirov will be announcing the product later today. And Max Mazin, I can't even announce the title of his talk. But it will be the talk about how it all works with a lot of code and you know, exciting details about this product. I hope uh, we have suspense enough for, for this announcement. All right. So a short intermediate summary where we are with Kotlin today. All the platforms, server, Android, uh, shared code on mobile devices, web, desktop, all together. This means full stack. This is where we are heading, and we we'll keep investing into this story. I guess it's been 23 minutes into the keynote. It's time to talk about some announcements. Again, I have to apologize. Colin's an open source project. You know everything if you care about looking at GitHub. But I'll still uh, walk you through things that are going there. Also, we're not releasing anything today. You know, uh, I quit releasing at conferences because you know why? A conference is something you need to prepare for. Then a release is something you need to prepare for. And there is only one me. And there is only one team. And we're not doing this. So uh, we're just giving you a heads up. The release is coming uh, some, sometime in, in spring this year. And I hope it will be great. And today, I'll just walk you through a few things uh, that are going to be there. Uh, so our main focus in this release are quality and performance. We've been adding many, many features in the past. And uh, this time, we wanted to just you know, slow down a little bit and polish things. Polish things a lot. It doesn't mean there, there won't be features. Of course, we, we're developers too, you know? We, we love doing features, but there is a lot of quality work, too. So one thing, uh, just, just check this out. It's, it's a video. I hope it works. Right, so here are two developers. They're working their IDs with different versions of Kotlin. And you can see that the person at the top is faster. You know why? Can you guess what happened? Like, you see, they're really faster. They're like the whole line ahead. You know what happened there? It's the code completion. It's got really faster, like three times as fast as it used to be. And uh, it's been great work done by our ID team. And we'll keep working on it. Now we have about 93% of our users get completion results in under 500 milliseconds. We can improve this too. And we can definitely work on those 7% that aren't there yet. But still, it's a good improvement already. Also. Uh, when you work in a Kotlin ID using Gradle, you know, there is this pain point called import, right? You change something in your Gradle file, and uh, yeah. So now it's going to be a lot less of, because uh, you can see the numbers, right? So it got a, a lot faster. It's like two and a half times faster on import, and will improve it further. And it uh, takes a lot less memory, like four times less memory which you know, is a game changer for many people. So and by the way, it's, it's released already. So I'm talking about 1.4 as a big release cycle, but some of these things are shipped because we want you to use them as soon as possible. In other news, Kotlin native compilation is being improved as well. So in development mode, we're now caching code 
uh, and can reuse the binaries from previous compilations. So you can get like significant speed ups already, and we'll keep working on this and make it even faster. But we understand that the biggest pain in the Kotlin community is the build speed. And one of the issues here is that you keep writing code, you know? So you, you write, like, we improve the compiler and the tool chain and everything, but you write more code. And like, the bigger the project, the slower the build. This, this is how it works. So we, while we're working on those incremental improvements, we understand that there is a more radical measure needed. And this is why I have to confess we're working on a new compiler. OK. <laughs> All right, so we, uh, we are. And uh, we want the new compiler to be fast and to be uniform and to be pluggable. So by, by fast, I mean we really want to speed up your builds not by percents, but by uh, a factor of, I'll show you how many. Uh, but also, we want it to be uniform, so it's uh, working the same way in all platforms. And thus, it can be pluggable that, uh, so that it can create a plugin that works in all platforms as well. Some of the parts of the new compiler are coming in 1.4. Some will come later. So I'll try to point out these details uh, during this talk. And it's going to be a lot of work, but it's pretty interesting. So the most exciting thing about the new compiler, I guess, is the speed. And the biggest bottleneck currently is what, what's called the front end of the compiler. It's the part that looks at your code, understands it, analyzes the types, so on and so forth. So before any code generation, you get this front end. And this is something that we started working on. It's not ready. It's not going to ship in 1.4. But it's already about 4.5 times faster than the old one, which means like, if you have your long build, it's going to be quite a bit shorter. Uh, so this is not finished, so the measurements are not uh, like perfect because uh, we'll be adding functionality to this subsystem, and it can get slower, but we're, we'll be also optimizing it. So we're actually aiming at the factor of five or something, but it's you know, hand-waving at the moment. Uh, what we have now does the bulk of the work, so we are pretty sure it can be really fast. Now, one thing from within the front end uh, of the new compiler is the new type inference. And the new type of inference engine will ship in 1.4. And this is not about performance. This is mostly about the nasty bugs that we couldn't really fix in the previous implementation because it wasn't flexible enough. So we'll ship with fixing a lot of bugs. It enables new language features. I'll highlight one of them later in this talk. And of course, it can be evolved and extended later, so it will enable even more language features in the future. Another part of the new compiler is the Unify backend. You know, the Kotlin has three uh, backends, the JVM and JS and uh, Kotlin Native. And all of, them, all of them are doing the same job. They are uh, converting the front-end representation into a uh, binary for whatever platform. So historically, the JVM and JS backends were uh, written completely separately, so they didn't share much code. And when we started Kotlin Native, we started building this infrastructure that would unify everything, which, which is based on an internal representation. We call it backend IR. So now we are migrating JVM and JS onto this new infrastructure. So all the three backends will be similar, and they will be sharing a lot of code. So if I want to introduce a language feature, I don't do it three times, but only one. And if I fix a bug, I fix it everywhere at once. This is coming in 1.4. We won't be switching all the users right away. So there will be ex an experimental period. But still, this is already around the corner. An interesting thing that's enabled by this uh, new unified backend is the possibility of compiler plugins, where you can uh, you know, write something to enhance or extend the functionality of Kotlin. And while we are shipping no API in 1.4, as usual, there are already people relying on that API. And well, of course, they're friends, so we're helping them. But yeah, so folks over at Google are working on something called Jetpack Compose, which is an awesome UI framework. 
Uh, and they are making a backend plugin. This is the heart of the uh, Jetpack Compose technology. And also, uh, our friends at Facebook are doing something very interesting. They are uh, making Kotlin a great language for machine learning and uh, AI. So they are implementing language extensions uh, called automated differentiation, so on and so forth. Uh, so Leland and Eric will give their talks about these very interesting initiatives uh, here at KotlinConf. If you're into the cutting edge stuff in the Kotlin ecosystem, I really advise you to attend those talks. I'd love to take questions at this point, but I won't. OK, another bit uh, for the new compiler is the portable format. So now we are um, available on many platforms. We need to uh, unify our distributable format for our libraries. So Caleb is the name for the new format. It will unify all the platforms. It contains a high-level representation of a column program, kind of like the like Java bytecode or whatever else, uh, whatever bytecode you know. Uh, and this means that this representation can be looked at. You can analyze it. You can transform it. So it's, it's a properly externalizable representation of a compiled column program. Uh, we'll start experimenting with it in 1.4, and we'll hopefully stabilize it over time. OK, so this is the new compiler. Now let's look at other areas. And I've been talking a lot about multi-platform, right? Because this is something very interesting about Kotlin. We want people to be able to share code and skills across platforms. So if you wrote something in Kotlin, you can use this code elsewhere. And if you acquired some expertise, some skills in Kotlin, you can use them on another platform. But whenever you want to do something platform specific that cannot be easily uh, done in another platform, something really cool that only this platform can do, you can always resort to the platform intro. So it's code sharing, skill sharing, plus 100% access to the platform. This is how we're trying to make it. And this is the diagram of how Kotlin multi-platform works. So at the core, there is common Kotlin which is the language, the core libraries, and the basic tool chain. So there, you write code in just Kotlin, and it works everywhere. Whenever you want to interact with a platform, you go to platform-specific versions of Kotlin, extensions to the language, specific libraries, so on and so forth. So Kotlin JVM, Kotlin JS, and the LLVM-based backend for Kotlin Native are all giving you the power to interop with the platform. And through these extensions, you can talk to the platform native code. So there is JVM code out there. You can access it. There is JS code out there. You can access it. And any kind of native code you can access as well, which means that th there are like a lot of platforms you can talk to, right? So it's anything Java. It's the browser. It's Node.js. It's Android, of course. And all the native platforms like Windows, Linux, Mac, microcontrollers, you name it. So this is the technology we're making, and a few interesting news about it. First of all, we are extending the set of the core libraries. There is, of course, the common standard library for everywhere. Uh, we have strings, we have collections, and, and all the necessary stuff is there. Now we have durations, too. And coroutines, coroutines are awesome, you know, and they work on every platform as well. Serialization is going to stabilize uh, in column 1.4, I hope. And IO and HTTP client are also there on all platforms. We are definitely adding date time because, you know, that everybody needs it. So in the news for the libraries, there will be two very interesting talks from uh, my teammates. Uh, Leonid will talk about uh, the design of the column serialization, which is Actually, it's kind of a borderline between library and language feature, so it's pretty cool. And Roman will we'll talk, we'll talk about something called Flow, which is the Kotlin implementation of uh, reactive streams, which helps you manipulate the streams of data using coroutines. And it's pretty interesting, because if you look at uh, some of the benchmarks, Kotlin Flow is not only very convenient, it's also much faster than some of the existing implementations of uh, reactive streams. So you don't only get like ergonomics, the nicer code, but you also get faster by adopting it. I hope you'll enjoy it. Then libraries, you know? Libraries are 
maybe the bulk of the Kotlin ecosystem. So we really need to care about those people who are writing the libraries. And this is why we are adding a few tools to help people. So there is going to be a library authors mode that will help you with uh, a few checks to make your APIs really robust and stable over time with uh, demanding explicit visibility and explicit public types where required. We're also working on DACA, which is the documentation generation tool. And this is the sketch of the design of uh, uh, how the docs will look. And note that uh, there in the top right car corner, there are many platforms. So Docker works with multi-platform libraries as well as single-platform ones. Talking about multi-platform, of course, we are investing in the mobile case. I've been talking about it, iOS and Android. And there will be an exciting talk about how stuff works there. And there have been very interesting improvements. I, it's, it's really a pity that I can't talk about them in the keynote because it's so exciting. But uh, Dmitry and Lilia will uh, talk about them in their talk. One announcement I would like to make around multi-platform mobile. We are going to give you an opportunity to run, debug, and test your iOS Kotlin apps from Android Studio. It will be done through a separate plugin, uh, a closed source plugin, because it uh, uses the uh, in proprietary parts of IntelliJ. But still, you'll be able to open your Kotlin code written for iOS in Android Studio and run on a device, run on a simulator, debug, test, so on and so forth. This is coming next year. And just to set the expectations right, this is not going to replace Xcode for quite a few things. You'll still need to enter Xcode, but your normal development cycle will be just one IDE. Plus, uh, we're not trying to add all the languages to one IDE so far. It's an interesting project, but it's a separate one. And here, uh, I'm talking only Kotlin. There will be no language support for Objective-C or Swift, but you can still do everything in Kotlin. You know that, right? So I hope you'll, you'll enjoy this. And to accompany it, uh, we are working, of course, on the Kotlin native runtime, which is what's running Kotlin on iOS. Uh, runtime performance is being improved gradually, so this is the uh, current result. Actually, Kotlin apps are fast enough on iOS already, but we are improving them over time. Another piece of news is that now it's not only iOS. It's tvOS and watchOS alike. So you can write your app and uh, ship it across all kinds of devices now. And to kind of playfully demonstrate that, here is an app that you can play here at ColinConf. It's called Colin Locator. Just go to a store, uh, either Android or uh, App Store, and find it. Or come to the uh, JetBrains booth there uh, in the exhibition room. So with this app, you can play an interesting game, which is called Colin Locator. You'll be treasure hunting around the venue. And uh, as you see, it can even run on a watch. It's done in Kotlin, all of it. So you can see like, how many things you can do with Kotlin today. And of course, working on such a huge thing as making mobile development enter a new era, we can't do this uh, without the help from the larger community. So here I highlight two talks. There, there actually are many more multi-platform talks here at KotlinConf, but these two are uh, I really want to highlight here. So Alexander will talk about Kotlin multi-platform in action, and there will be a preview of a very interesting library that allows you to share UI across Android and iOS. And also Kevin will give you an insight into uh, concurrency model for Colin on iOS, which is a very exciting topic. If you are into really relevant hardcore stuff, please attend. But multi-platform is not only mobile, right? Multi-platform is everywhere. And of course, web is one of the biggest use cases. The world runs on the web. And here is one bit that we're adding for Kotlin JS in the browser. We now have the quick reload experience that you probably know from other JavaScript worlds, right? So you can just change some code and it reloads in the browser almost instantly. We'll be improving this experience, but 
I hope this will be like even a nice game to play. You just change it from hey Kotlin to hey Kotlin Conf to hey Weld, so on and so forth, and it reloads and reloads and reloads, and it's pretty cool. Um, also, the uh, JS uh, compiler is improving, so the new backend can generate much smaller binaries. So now we go from you know, like uh, 700k to 400k, which makes it like smaller and smaller, and the optimized app can be really, really small. This is uh, the benchmark of Colin X coroutines, which is a substantial library, so it's a lot of code, and can be compressed down to 45 kilobytes. Also, we're working on the JavaScript introp, and there, you know, the, the well of JavaScript is huge. We're adding things one by one, and uh, uh, the new GS uh, ecosystem will support uh, ES modules, which is one of the new standards. Also, we are introducing Ducat, which connects uh, the Kotlin types with TypeScript types. So by using Ducat, you can just attach an NPM dependency to your Kotlin JS code, and it will pick up the DTS files and co convert them to Kotlin. So you, you have seamless access to uh, TypeScript types through the Kotlin type system. Sebastian will give you more details on this uh, here at Colin Conf. And one other thing I would like to talk about regarding the web. Who knows WebAssembly? OK. Folks, you should learn about it. Uh, who runs code in WebAssembly? OK. OK. So, so I can tell you um, this may be the future. Um, so actually, what WebAssembly is, it's a new uh, web standard supported by all the major browser vendors where they're basically exposing a virtual machine to the users of the browser. So it's, it's not only the JavaScript source, but also a special virtual machine uh, that you can compile to and run any kind of code. And of course, Kotlin would like to run there. And we actually have a working prototype for uh, WebAssembly. And we, we showed it, I think, maybe two years ago. But there is a trick. So the current WebAssembly that exists in every browser out there uh, is an unmanaged runtime, which means you have to manage your memory manually. There is no garbage collection. And it's kind of interesting. So you have uh, what you can do is compile Kotlin with Kotlin native. It adds garbage collection. So now you're running your own garbage collection in an isolated runtime inside a browser with a lot of garbage collection around it. You know, it's not the best case. So uh, the current WebAssembly works best with uh, uh, languages like C++ or Rust, where you can manage your memory manually, and this is how it works. But the WebAssembly community is looking into actually adding the proper GC to the WebAssembly runtime. And there, languages like Kotlin should really shine. So we are talking to the developers of WebAssembly to make sure that Kotlin will be really welcome in this ecosystem. This is very early work, like we have very, very small prototypes, but still, it's pretty exciting. OK, I guess I'm done talking about multi-platform, but it's not all. One more thing is even beyond the world of software development as such, right? Not everybody is a programmer, but many more people than just software developers write code. For example, many Many people nowadays do code for data science. And here's a screenshot of Kotlin running in a Jupyter notebook over Spark and plotting uh, the results with Let's Plot. This is pretty cool because this means that the essentials of the uh, standard da data science tool set are available for Kotlin. And Roman will give you more details on this project later. So this is something that's happening inside JetBrains. All right. I guess I'm sort of done with the tooling announcements. And now let's talk about the language. Well, again, we were trying to focus more on, on the quality and performance and stuff like this. So no big feature announcements, no ternary operator. <laughs> well, ternary operator is really nasty, I should say. I was, I was almost sure we can make it make it work, but it, like, it resists very hard. <laughs> yeah, but still, we are adding a few nice things. I'll highlight only one here. 
and you can uh, get the information about the rest in our announcements on the web. So who knows what KT7770 is? Oh, a few people do. OK. Uh, th there was a small bet inside the JetBrains team, like, will people come with, uh, in t-shirts saying KT7770? Not really. OK, nice. Yeah, so, so this, is, this is just a feature request in our issue tracker filed back in 2015, so it's not that old. Some are filed back in 2010, for example. Uh, but still, so this is a feature we're adding now. It's mostly about uh, you know, convenience and Java intro. I'm talking about function interfaces. You probably know that uh, Java 8, along with Lambdas, added uh, this idea of SAMs, you know, single abstract method types, which kind of addresses uh, the lack of uh, function types in Java. Kotlin had function types from the very beginning, so we were kind of, do we really need this feature? Not sure, so we were postponing it. But over time, we saw that uh, it's actually very convenient to not only have a function type, but give it a name, and not as a type alias, but as a proper separate type. And this is what we're adding. So Kotlin is about fun, right? We're adding a bit more fun to Kotlin. And you can now say that you have some fun interfaces. So there are boring interfaces and fun interfaces. Uh, yeah, so, so a fun interface, uh, it's of course, stands for a function interface, uh, is something with only one abstract method. And you can uh, basically use it as a function type. So you can pass a lambda where this interface is expected. This helps you uh, with, with your typed handlers for lots of stuff, and also helps with the Java intro because uh, you can now migrate an entire Java 8 library uh, along with the interfaces without breaking any client code. So this is one feature I wanted to highlight. There are a few more like stuff around commas, for example, It'll, you may be find interesting. So there are really, really many small improvements. So most of them are not actually features. They're kind of bug fixes or inconsistency fixes and stuff like that. And this is like, this actually takes a lot of time to adjust things in the language this way, because if you just randomly touch something in a language, something breaks. And something breaks not on your machine, but like on your machines. And, and this is a lot of responsibility. But we really need to do this because uh, we want Kotlin to be modern even 20 years from now. So here are the three driving principles of language evolution that we are trying to follow. So keeping the language modern means that if any kind of idea gets old and irrelevant, we need to phase it out. So all things should go. We do not want to accumulate legacy. But on the other hand, if we just remove stuff, the world breaks, right? And, and you hate us. And also, I don't want to follow the example of some other language ecosystems that I'm not naming here, that we're introducing new versions nobody's really eager to adopt because there are breaking changes. So there is a conflicting principle of comfortable updates. Like, every time you update to a new version of Kotlin, it should be easy for you. You shouldn't be broken by it, so on and so forth. And these two you know, are pretty hard to keep in balance, but we're trying. And the uh, main tool we're using here is a feedback loop. So we need to be in the loop with you folks to give you a heads up, like, OK, now we're deprecating this thing. Like, in two years, it goes away. So we need to make sure that everybody migrates, and we need to provide tools uh, for you to migrate. So we need to stay in touch to make sure all the information gets around. And uh, here, I really advise you to actively stay in, in the loop with us. You'll help us improve the ecosystem. So if you're not already there, enter the EAP program. So early access builds are as good as production. <laughs> OK, OK, I'm joking. They're almost as good as production. Uh, but uh, you can give us early feedback, and it's pretty important. Also, uh, we. Uh, issue surveys sometimes and ask you questions, please answer. It can help us improve Kotlin. And even if you don't have energy for any of that, just enable usage stats in the IDE. So one thing you can do without like any effort, just go to your IDE, open settings, and if you have it this way, make it this way. It's anonymous data. I'm not going to spy on you. What I care about is, am I going to break your code? Because I don't want to. But you know? If I don't like somebody really, really a lot, I still can't because it's anonymized. Sorry. 
OK, so yeah, this way you can uh, stay in the loop. Uh, it, it doesn't take any effort. Like, you don't even need to report an exception to us. Just, just send stats uh, will help you. Like this example with completion, for example. Right? Uh, somebody gets their completion really slow. And how do you report that? But if you get on the radar, we'll see like, some, some, some of your environment, and we'll try to look into it. It's already better than nothing. OK, it's time to conclude. And the three main takeaways from this talk are here. So Kotlin is about people, ideas, and software. It's an ecosystem that brings people together uh, to work in a common way on many common values. We are constantly improving by staying in the feedback loop. So we really care about what you think. Come and tell us, even passively, through stats or something else. Also, the community is about participation. Anything you do, from code you write to tutorials, uh, experience reports, even just a like or retweet. This is all value you bring to the community. Thank you for your participation. You'll have a very interesting two days. So it's talks, it's networking, it's very interesting conversation, a party, a surprise announcement, like everything is going to happen here. I wish you a great time and have a nice Kalenkampf. Thank you.